Always happy to be joined by the best in the business, John Anik, who's going to be on the call this Saturday for UFC 299. John, uh, how are you? A bit of a home game this weekend. Uh, how excited are you for that? We'll take it, man. I would always prefer to put rubber to the pavement as opposed to getting on a metal tube. I would drive to most any UFC show I could, but a uh, little challenging with the back-to-back. -back. We were supposed to be in Saudi Arabia last weekend. Instead, of course, it was the UFC Apex in Vegas, which is a little closer, but uh, it's rare that I have a fight night on the front of a pay-per-view, so I am about to dive into my prep full throttle as soon as we're done our little chat today, my man. Without giving too much away, what does your prep look like uh, going into a pay-per-view card? Uh, maybe peel back the curtain a little bit for our uh, viewers here. Well, just imagine if I did not have a live event last weekend, in theory, I could have used that whole weekend prepping for UFC 299. That's so true. suffice to say the preparation is a totally different animal when I'm in a back-to-back -back situation. Now, with respect to my brethren in the NFL who go 17, 20 straight weeks, you have my ultimate respect. But as you know, James, our show is a little bit of a different beast. So today I just finished taping the Anakin Florian podcast. I'm going to talk to you and it's exclusively fighter prep until my eyes just tell me they can't do it anymore. So I'll dive in with blank fight cards I'll write new fight cards on as many fighters that I, as I can handle today. I've already taken my old notes out of the library behind me. So uh, just fighter prep really today and tomorrow. I have a few voiceover elements to do. All the in arena stuff that you hear gets done before I get to town. And then, uh, yeah, Wednesday at some point in time, we will uh, hit the pavement and uh, it'll be a sprint to the finish. Looking forward to it. Uh, this main event's awesome. We've got Sean O'Malley, Cheeto Vera, the long-awaited rematch, O'Malley's first title defense. Uh, how much, I want to start first with this, how much uh, of the fact that Cheeto Vera has never been finished in his UFC career, how much does that play into the main event on Saturday with Sean O'Malley typically finishing his fights within the judges' scorecards? Well, with respect to Marlon Cheeto Vera's strength of schedule, and it's a good question. Uh, I'm still not sure he's fought a sniper quite like Sean O'Malley. He's fought Hall of Famers. He's fought some unbelievable guys. But if anybody in theory can test that particular trend, it is somebody who manages distance and range the way Sean does. And Sean obviously has a lot of athletic gifts. But yes, I mean, Marlon Cheeto Vera's durability historically should be factored into the handicap, I would think. And I just think the experience that he has accrued, his cardiovascular base, reciprocally his ability to put you away in any number of different phases, all feathers in the cap of Marlon Cheeto Vera. I do think, though, this is a, a unique champion. And uh, I got to think Cheeto has prepared accordingly for that uh, particular reality. The longer the fight goes, do you give that edge to Cheeto just because he has, you know, been in those deep waters before? Or do you think someone like O'Malley who, you know, again, he sort of prides himself in his conditioning and everything. Do you think that'll favor him? Like, how are you looking at that aspect of the fight? Well, certainly it depends how those first 10, 15 minutes, first three rounds were to play out, right? If Sean O'Malley is picking his spots with calculated risk and touching Cheeto up, then certainly it stands to reason that O'Malley could continue to do that over the final 10 minutes, even getting on a bicycle at times and be the fresher athlete at the end of 25 minutes. But yeah, I do think the pendulum might swing mid fight. If Cheeto is able to survive that proverbial early storm, it's a fascinating matchup. You know, one thing that I have wondered aloud about Sean O'Malley's championship reign, which is just getting underway is what is his relative durability? You know, this is a guy who not only has gotten injured in at least two UFC fights against Andre Sukumtat and Cheeto Vera. But, you know, he also, I think, is a guy who going into the Aljamain Sterling fight was injured. And if that fight was one in which he was forced to play the long game, maybe we were told he wasn't really going to be able to grapple that night. So as much as we want to sit here and laud the durability of Cheeto Vera, it is something that you can question on the side of Sean O'Malley. So certainly he's gone to great lengths to do what he can to make himself as durable as possible. He certainly added muscle mass. You know, he's got a great kinship going with Brandon Harris, the way they work on breathing and strength and conditioning. Um, but it's one of many factors in this fight potentially. And it's why I think it makes it really very interesting, a main event here at 299. And something you touched on there, and I thought this was really interesting in the interview that uh, Brett Okamoto did with, with O'Malley, is that he's really dialed in. He has people handling his social media. There's no distractions. He talked about, you know, being in a, in, I, I don't know what you call it. It's like an RV that, that he bought, and basically he'll be watching tape on the way to practice. This isn't something we've seen from him before. How much from, like, a mental perspective is that something you're sort of keeping tabs on in the main event with O'Malley being sort of laser-focused on this fight? 
Yeah, there's no doubt. And I think when you become the champion, you should take things up a notch, right? Yeah. Because now you are the hunted and it really doesn't matter who you fight. Certainly the preparation, if he's fighting Marab Dwalishwili in his second defense, theoretically, is going to be different than it is for Marlon Cheeto Vera. But in terms of just the overall investment, bodily, uh, mentally, and everything, uh, you got to go all hands on deck, all systems go. But I will say, James... I think he's been doing a lot of this stuff for a long time. I mean, maybe not with the bells and whistles like the RV, but he's always been a committed athlete. He's always been a more willing grappler than people want to give him credit. You know, I remember watching him grapple like Gilbert Melendez years ago up, you know, a weight class. So I don't know. I feel like he's always been a, a committed athlete with an appetite and a passion for martial arts improvement. Uh, and he can shoot the hell out of a basketball as well, which you can't say for a lot of his contemporaries. So uh, I'm glad he's getting the credit, but uh, you know, I would scoff at those who suggest he hasn't always been a worker. The winner of this fight, um, you, we talked about this last time we, we chatted with uh, Bilal Muhammad and the whole title situation at 170. I think at 135, we're in agreement that uh, Marab Devalishvili should be getting the winner of this fight. Do you think that happens? Because obviously the UFC has different plans when it comes to sort of the enter entertainment value and there's some bigger names out there, but how confident are you that Marab will get the winner of this fight? Oh, I'm confident. And I think look no further than Sean O'Malley mentioning the name there is history with these two guys the red jacket and everything else the mm -hmm. aljamain Sherling chapter in both of their respective careers right if either of them writes a book there's an aljo chapter right in marab's book and sean o'malley's but i think there's a lot of reasons to make that fight i mean certainly i don't have to tell you how wildly entertaining marab dwalish willie is on social media but as a fighter he's all offense all the time and even if maybe some of his style lacks technique. I mean, Umar Nurmagomedov and others have questioned, you know, a lot of what Marab does, but he is the machine personified. It's the perfect nickname. And I think absolutely he's going to be next. The only thing that could get in the way of it would be a potential super fight with uh, Sean O'Malley moving up to featherweight to challenge Ilya Topuria. Uh, but I don't think that is imminent. So, yes, I mean, I feel just as convicted or perhaps even more so than Bilal Muhammad that Marab Dwalish Willie is going to fight the winner of Sean O'Malley and Marlon Cheeto Bear. I love this co-main event. You've got Dustin Poirier, Benoit Saint-Denis. Saint-Denis on the come up. Poirier coming off that knockout loss over Justin Gaethje. And it's my understanding that Poirier was the one that wanted the five rounds, which is understandable. He's got the five-round experience. We haven't seen Saint-Denis go uh, longer than, than a round or two here. Uh, my question to you is, because I know you're a betting guy, Dustin Poirier right now, plus 170. Should he be that going into this fight, considering all of his accolades? It keeps rising, man, you know, yeah. plus 180 now, depending on where you're looking, right? It's absolutely crazy to see that type of number next to Dustin Poirier's name. Now, in a broad sense, as someone who's been betting on sports for 30 years, you're betting on the number, not the fighter. So yeah. I can understand why a lot of handicappers see value. And I'll just tell you, we just taped the Anakin Florian podcast, Kenny Florian and my MMA handicapper, Brian Petrie, both picked Dustin Poirier at plus 180. Now, when the question becomes gun to your head, who are you picking? Or like to save a rescue dog's life, who are you picking? Maybe one of those guys might have gone with Benoit saint -Denis, but I don't think that is the case. I can understand why people see value in Dustin Poirier, uh, despite the MMA miles on his tank, despite the fact that he got knocked out in his last fight. I mean... You cannot argue with Dustin Poirier's body of work. Most people believe he's the best fighter to have never won the undisputed title in UFC history. Uh, his strength of schedule is otherworldly. But Benoit Saint-Denis is on a seek-and-destroy mission, and I believe he deserves to be the betting favorite. I think it's a competitive fight. I think it's closer to your point than the betting line suggests. But, uh, you know, Benoit Saint-Denis is on a serious mission, and it's just amazing you know, you can only have the scalps on your resume that they put in front of you. So, you know, he doesn't necessarily have that signature win. But why is Dustin Poirier accepting this fight? Because Benoit saint -Denis is all the rage. He knew the fans would get excited about him beating potentially Benoit saint -Denis. So I'm excited to see what the Frenchman can do with the showcase. It's happening pretty quickly for him, to be sure. Another really fun fight on this card is Kevin Holland and Michael Venom Page. Of course, Michael Venom Page, we've wanted to see in the UFC for such a long time. Um, he's finally here, and he's fighting an opponent that should be a really fan-friendly fight. We know Kevin Holland likes to keep it standing. What are you expecting from this? Because I think the one sort of knock on Page, aside from the fact that he's a little bit older, is maybe the competition hasn't been in there outside of uh, you know who Kevin Holland has fought. What do you make of this fight coming up on Saturday? Well, you know, age is a potential factor, right? Michael Venom Page, 36 years old as he arrives at this UFC debut. And certainly I don't have to tell you about the consequences of being hit by this man and just the way he is able to close distance and blitz and use his speed and his power in unison. 
But I think there are a lot more questions on the Kevin Holland side, namely, how does he approach this particular fight? Does he want to wrestle? Does he want to grapple? Kevin hasn't always been of clear intentions when it comes to how he proceeds with his UFC career. He's not chasing belts as much as he is chasing American dollars and power to him, you know, but this would be a matchup in theory in which he would uh, do well to mix it up a little bit. But I love the way the promotion went here. It's a close fight as far as the betting line is concerned. And, uh, I don't know if Michael Venom Page is ever going to realize top five status in the welterweight division. I think what happens this weekend is go going to go a long way in terms of settling that. Um, but I'm glad it's happening at whatever time of Michael Venom Page's career. And he seems to have a lot of good youthful energy about it. So uh, pretty close fight and very much looking forward to calling this one, James. And uh, staying in the welterweight division, we've got another fight that kind of reminds me a bit of the Poirier and Benoit Saint Denis fight in Gilbert Burns and Jack Della Maddalena. Same situation, the veteran Gilbert Burns, uh, the underdog going into this fight. Uh, what do you make of this one? Because I think with uh, you know Jack obviously hasn't lost in the UFC, has that knockout power, but Gilbert Burns has fought some pretty good opponents in his career as well. Yeah, another fascinating fight in the welterweight division. And I think Jack Della Maddalena has got to love the fact that people are looking at his resume with back-to-back -back split decision wins. Both fights in which he was challenged. It was a great fight at Noche UFC with Kevin Holland. And then the time before that, circumstances resulting in a last-minute opponent and everything else. But I think Jack Della has to love the fact that people are maybe questioning him a little bit. In some respects, there's no substitute for the experience that Gilbert Burns has accrued, but I think a lot of handicappers would tell you that that does come with a price. But I think Burns now has had the requisite time off to put himself in a really good place coming into this fight. You know, Jack Della Maddalena has submission prowess in his own right, but he's not on that level of Gilbert Dorino Burns, and I wouldn't be surprised to see Burns try to mix things up and really you know, get this fight to the ground and try to challenge Jack there. Uh, but it's just a great fight. It just feels like perfect matchmaking and uh, just glad I don't have to make a pick. Stylistically, absolutely fascinated by that one. And then we've got the big bantamweight fight between Piotr Jan, uh, Yudong Song. Uh, you know, Jan's the favorite and I don't disagree with that. I think if you look at who he's fought, he's a former champion. This is a good test for Song Yudong. But my question to you, John, is Song Yudong catching Piotr Jan at a good time with the layoff and the losing streak that he has coming into this fight? Well, you can go both ways, right? Historically, as a sports better, they would say don't get in the way of streaks. Mm -hmm. Regardless of sport, right? The Toronto Maple Leafs lose three straight games, right? I would be trying to bet them until they get a win, right? But sometimes you can really pay for that, right? So on paper, it's like, man, is Piotr Jan really going to lose four fights in a row? Well, the action coming in right now is suggestive that maybe he will. He was a much bigger favorite 48 hours ago than he is as we sit here and talk at the outset of fight week. So some of that has to do with Song Yudong really coming into his own in a couple of UFC main events. And I just think Song Yudong has done a lot of things the right way and hasn't been rushed into anything by the UFC. So yeah, you could argue he's fighting Piotr Jan at a pretty good time, just given some of the recent setbacks for Piotr Jan. But I think some of that has to do with just Jan's strength of schedule more than anything else. I mean, nobody's really beating Marab Dwalish Willie right now. Some might argue it's a bad time to be fighting Piotr Jan, right? Like Joe Pfeiffer just lost to Jack Hermanson. I would hate to be the next guy who fights Joe Pfeiffer, just given what he might have learned from that particular fight. So could be a bad time to be fighting Piotr Jan. Yeah. But I think we'll get a lot of answers as to where Jan really is. Is he closer to regaining his title or closer to the end? We'll get a lot of answers this weekend. But I think it's a prime Piotr Jan who shows up against Song Yudong Saturday night. From a betting perspective, and I know it's a little chalky, but the over two and a half, I'm seeing it like minus 285. I just see that hitting. Like, I, you know, if you look at both fighters, typically they do go the distance. I know Song has had a few finishes in there, as is Piotr Jan, but um, I, I really think this fight is probably hitting the scorecards, especially with it being a three-round fight. Yeah, I mean, I guess if I was forced to choose, I try not to get too predictive. I would probably yeah. say over two and a half, however chalky that may be. Certainly Song Yudong has that power and Piotr Jan has power as well. And he certainly has a way of breaking people down with his boxing, with his leg kicks and everything else. So, uh, but this sport, bro, like I can't tell you how much money I save, even with all the inside information I may have on a given fight night. I can't tell you how much money I save by being contractually prevented from betting on this stuff. And I will also say as a longtime ravenous sports better, I don't play totals, bro. Like mm -hmm. I, much prefer side straight wagers as opposed to trying to figure out how many goals they're going to be in a given game or how many points in a given contest. Right. So, um, yeah, I mean, we're aligned there, but generally speaking, I'm a straight wager guy and I'm always on the side. 
Anything else on this card? I mean, obviously, there's some great fights in the prelim. We've got Curtis Blades and Jouten Almeida. We've got the Macy Barber, and um, and I, I want to call her Chukagan. I know her last name something different now because of the, the marriage. I'll let you correct me here. But uh, there's a lot of good fights on the prelims. Uh, what are some fights that stand out to you or maybe any things that you're looking forward to on the prelims? Well, you mentioned that women's flyweight fight. Excuse me, uh, Caitlin Chukagian, now Caitlin Sermonar. She hasn't fought since 2022, and that was a fight against Benal Fior in which Sermonar missed weight. So I think you're just going to get the very best of her because she's fighting Macy Barber, who looks like she might be one win away from a championship opportunity. She has connective tissue with a lot of the athletes, Alexa Grasso and others. So huge spot for Macy Barber trying to extend her winning streak to six. And that's going to be in front of a massive ESPN audience. So I'm happy for Macy. Happy to see Caitlin back. And we'll see what version of her we get. And then the feature prelim. You mentioned it, but I got to get to the heavyweights, right? Because this was going to happen as a main event. And instead, it's happening as a three-round prelim. But Curtis Blades has one of the best heavyweight resumes for a guy who has never fought for the undisputed title. That has eluded him every step of the way. When he's been in that title eliminator, he hasn't been able to break through. When he's had the long winning streak, they have chosen someone else. How does he fare against Jailton Almeida, who could find himself fighting Tom Aspinall in two months in Rio, depending on how this goes. So massive stakes in the heavyweight division and uh, just an embarrassment of riches for us as UFC at UFC 299 and then 300, man. We're just, uh, we're excited. It's going to be a sprint to the finish, as I said, but I'm excited to, uh, to get down to Miami here in about 48 hours. Um, last time we talked a little bit of hockey, I always like uh, getting a, a few little takes here. Do you pay attention to the trade deadline at all? That's coming up here on Friday in Canada, here where I live, I will be taking the day off and glued to the TV. That's just how I am. Is it as big of a deal for you? I know hockey, not maybe as, as high on the hierarchy for you. No, I mean, I bet the NHL much more than I bet the NBA in season. Uh, I just bought a bunch of random future tickets when I was out there. One on the Winnipeg Jets to win the Western conference. I bet on the Dallas stars as well to win the whole thing just because I like the price. But I will not be tracking the trading deadline because these UFC back-to-backs are just absolutely brutal. But hopefully, if there's room for my Boston Bruins to upgrade, they will do so. But unfortunately, living down here in South Florida, I'm afraid the Florida Panthers might win the whole goddamn thing. Okay. There we go. There we go. I like that. Uh, We're going to end with some rapid-fire questions, John. So just whatever comes to mind, uh, tell me what's off the top of your head here. Uh, Who is your favorite athlete outside of combat sports? I thought you were going to say, who's your favorite fighter right now? Dan Hooker has been that guy. Mm -hmm. Favorite non-Boston athlete was always Kobe Bryant, but my favorite Boston athlete of all time was was Nomar Garcia Parra. I love it. Uh, Favorite movie? Gosh, I, I'll just go. I'll just go total Boston Homer and say Goodwill Hunting. But uh, Raging Bull would probably be a close second. Favorite TV show? Dude, I don't watch a lot of TV, man. Uh, probably The Office back in the day. Uh, favorite uh, cheat meal? I'm sure you're a guy who's got to eat a little bit healthy. You're in good shape. Is there like a meal you look forward to that you're not really supposed to have? Yeah, Chinese food or uh, a cheeseburger. Uh, favorite comedian? Joe Rogan. Uh, favorite travel destination you've been all over the world anywhere in the united states of america anywhere i don't need my passport i'll say san diego california or uh hawaii favorite animal dog what's your hidden talent john i mean i used to be able to sing a little bit before uh before video games chewed up my voice but uh i can shoot a basketball uh and your last last one here what is your biggest pet peeve people who don't know how to load a dishwasher you know, I mean, it seems pretty simple to me. You try to do it as neatly as possible. You start in the back, but, uh, you know, one day, some of the people in my house will figure it out. There you go. John, thanks so much for doing this. We're looking forward to the call on Saturday. Uh, let us know before we go. Anakin Florian podcast. When is that dropping and anything else you got coming up? I'll give you the last word. Thank you, my man. Anakin Florian podcast drops Monday and Wednesday nights on the DraftKings YouTube channel. Also on the Anakin Florian podcast, YouTube channel. And, uh, just excited to bring all of you UFC 299 on pay-per-view this weekend. You can go to John and get all of your merchandise for UFC 299. One more sleep. The Anakin Florian podcast, 20% off with promo code. One more sleep.